Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the ZFS command, which is the main command that we use from day to day for managing the data sets um, that have been added to a pool. So let's start by seeing what pools we have. We can use the zpool import command for that. And what this does by itself is just scan the disks for any pools that um, have yet to be um, mounted, if you like, to the system. Well, there are no, none to import, and that's because I destroyed all the pools that were available um, previously. So I'm going to create a new pool. Um, in fact, I'm going to create a couple, I think. Um, yeah, what I'll do is I'll create one called Disk Pool, actually. Disk Pool. And that'll be based on one of my disks. I forgot to put the command in, so create is what I want to do. And I'll create a, f sorry, that's the wrong one. Start again. This pool will be a real disk. And I'll create one called file pool, which will be based on the file system. So I've got two different types of, or two different pools with different type of devices in. And if I did zpool status, there's nothing to indicate the different apart from the details and how these pools are constructed. If I did zpool list. Again, there's nothing there to give away what sort of um, devices are created. The only thing that's of notable difference is the size. So this is 1.3 terabytes whereas the file is just under a gigabyte. So what I'm going to do first of all is create a data set under each of these pools. And to do that we've got the ZFS command and again that's got a whole host of commands available. Perhaps are just a few more than the zpool has got. And there are some equivalent commands which do similar things. So for example, there's a create command. And that's how we create a data set on a pool. So when we do the create command, we have to specify the pool we want to use. So the first pool I'm going to use is the disk pool. Oops. And I want to create a data set or a file system on, on top of this. I'll just call it data set. And that's been created. And I'll do the same for the file pool as well. Oops. And I can look at the file systems that I've created now with ZFS list. So again, it's similar to zpool. And it shows the data sets we've created now you'll notice there's also two additional data sets that we haven't created. One's called disk pool and one's called fire pool. Um, you may be thinking, oh well, that's the name of the pool. Well, indeed it is. In fact, when you create a pool, a, a default data set with the same name is created for you. And you can, in fact, start using that data set and put files in it and just treat it like any other data set. It's normally recommended not to do that because it's at the top level, if you like, the pool level. You've got less uh, flexibility as to what you can do with that data set. So it's recommended normally never to use that for data 
and to just create individual data sets with ZFS on top of that and just leave this always empty so it's always got a few hundred K uh, used and, and to never use the top level um, ZFS data set or, or rather Z pool data set um, you can do but as I say you'll you'll find when you start to use more of the functions with the ZFS that you realize it's not such a good idea to to use that you can also see with this ZFS list where these data sets appear in the file system so you can see the pool data set the one that's created automatically when we create a pool is mounted on the root by default and the directory name is the directory is the name given to the pool by default and then the data set as you might expect is created with the data set name under the, the pool name on the root you can alter that there are options to alter the mount point uh, you can specify when you create the data set or when you mount the data set um, so for example the mount command it's got these options here one of the options is mount point so you can specify at that point um, you can also specify it when you create it again there's these O property equals values and again you'd specify as you create it minus O mount point equals and then somewhere some empty file system uh, sorry some empty directory within the file system where you want this data set to appear and that location is persistent so the next time the um, pool is mounted it will recall where the data set was mounted and it will mount it at that position so you don't have to keep reallocating or, or telling ZFS where you want the data set to be mounted but by default and generally this is sufficient sometimes you might want specific uh, mount points for example you might want to put all your home directories onto a individual data sets and therefore you'd specify slash home slash the username as a mount point for a user's data set and again as I mentioned in previous video I think there's quotas you can specify so you could specify a quota for each of these data sets so the user can't use more than you know 100 gigabytes say for their home directory just to ensure that um, you know they don't hog all the disk space for example or take up disk space that may be used by the system and so on so there we have the data sets we can now list them because they're just ordinary directories part of the file system so we can look at disk pool there's a data set directory and we can look inside the data set directory and of course there's nothing there there's no fancy hidden files or anything there's nothing funny sort of thing you might get with windows for example where there's hidden files which are meta files to do with the file system there's nothing to get in your way nothing extraneous there at all um, now one thing it catches me out sometimes when I forget that I've mounted things at a particular point I try to remove a directory and it won't remove and that's just worth remembering that you can't do that you get this sort of um, error and you think oh something to use it you know I'm in that directory on another terminal somewhere or another session and you can't understand why you can't remove it and the reason is it's because ZFS is using it that's what's using it that's why it's busy so it's just sometimes if you've got a ZFS running just list it see if the directory that you can't remove with that error um, is actually a data set and that explains why you can't remove it um, it's the same with RM minus RF if you do that you can't remove it either um, one thing worth noticing is that of course the um, directories or the pools that have been created so there's this pool and there's file pool they're automatically owned by root as are any new data sets that are added to them so you need to change them the ownership if you want a ordinary user to um, access them be able to access them so if I change the access to these two data sets
Okay, I can't do that. So you can see, oh, let's do LS minus LD. So you can see both these directories are now under a kernel text. So if I was to get up a new terminal and log in as kernel text, oops, cd into um, this pool. So I've created the directory there. There's no, no problems there about me doing that now. Whereas obviously in the top level directory, like I said, this is where I wouldn't want to normally create anything. And this is the reason why I haven't changed the permissions on the pool directory. You can see they're both still root. Um, you can see the permissions work. I can't do anything there. Um, there's no, no permissions because it's owned by root. So it all kind of works ni quite nicely by default. Um, what I can do now is to, if I go back to the first terminal, which, which is my root one, what I'm going to do is get the Zpool IO stat up and just demonstrate this in action. So I'll do, say, a 10 second interval. And while that's running, I'll go back to the kernel text directory. I'm going to go to this pool, so it's the data set, and I've got a little utility here that I knocked up to create files, just some random files. So I'll just create some um, files. Let's do uh, some large files and let's create 10 of them. Let's create 100 actually. And let's just do random bytes. So while that's creating, f oh, that's not enough. Let's create some bigger ones. I'm going to leave this running for a while. Let's create some humongous ones. So while that's running, that's creating some files in the background. You can see now how this is reporting. There's on this uh, 10 second slice, there's 11 write transactions or operations and transfer rate was approximately three and a third megabytes and 10 seconds later we're doing 105 at 52 meg per second and 133 transactions there at nearly 70. Bearing in mind this is only a I think it's a SATA 1 generation 1 on a, what uh, I've got two I've got the built-in card the chipset um, SATA interface plus a separate card on a PCI, uh, PCI slot so it's only like 33 megahertz it's not a not a bad rate it's going at considering it's um, you know quite old technology um, on some setups I've got um, you know I can see in the order of three nearly 400 megabytes per second and I'm sure on a you know a SAS drive with you know ultra modern interfaces with a good configuration you could probably get a lot lot faster than that much much faster but yeah as you can see it's still running there and it's um it's you know ticking around 60 65 megs per second on the disk so that's a, a reasonable rate the file will be a little bit slower because if you imagine it's got an extra layer it's got the uh, actual file system, Yext 4 file system, then it's got the ZFS layer on top of it, so it's um, it would be a little bit slower. So if I go into the file pool data set and do the same thing, you'll see, in fact you won't see this now, uh, yes you will, sorry, yeah, the file pool. You'll see it's much slower now um, when this settles down. Let's just let that settle down a little bit. So yeah, it's running about, what's that, about a third of the speed. Um, and there's more transactions, so it's maybe because of the the layout, I don't know, maybe because of the size, possibly. Um, you can see it's filling up quite a lot, actually. That's how much space has been used and this is how much is free what you'll actually notice is when it comes to a certain point the 
file system really does start grinding to a halt it becomes much much slower initially this has been fast because the memory is used as a cache um, but even if there wasn't a lot of memory you can see how much this is slowing by the difference between that figure and that figure is about 150 meg about 150 meg there but then all of a sudden it's dropped to about 60 meg there and here it's dropped to about 12 meg so it's really starting to slow up and this is because the file system is filling up it gets a lot lot slower so that's another thing about the fragmentation as you're filling up the disk it's trying to find gaps I presume where it can write data without fragmenting the disk and because of that it's slowing up it's making it harder to actually um, uh, fill up and you can also see the data right here it started off at 20 meg uh, 20 meg there 1960 it's been dropping and now it's just settling down to roughly 1.6 meg as it as it fills up so I'll stop that for the moment so I can do Z pool uh, status to just check the status that just checks the health of the pools it doesn't really tell us much we can do Z pool list to see the overall capacity of the of the pools you can see the disk pool which is one disk one and a half terabytes roughly the seven gig being allocated in the few minutes that I ran that for so you can see how much faster it went because the file pool was only allocated 800 meg there's no fragmentation on this pool because there's so much more space uh, and likewise capacity I mean 7 gig of 1.5 terabytes is you know nothing whereas on the file pool because there's limited space it's slowed down the fragmentation has increased incredibly at 68% fragmentation and the capacity is over 8% so you can see the difference um, as, as we get to fill the pool up and again you can see the allocated space and the free space has settled down a little bit here it might have managed to jiggle things around a little bit so it's found an extra megabyte it could uh, squeeze in for the allocated and uh, it gives us an extra megabyte free so it's, it's doing stuff in the background all the time trying to optimize how it stores the data on the disk Again, it's not necessarily performance, it's all about integrity um, and making the best use of the space. Um, so the next thing I need to show is uh, destroying a data set. So I'll come out of here in case that causes any errors while I'm in that data set. I'll go back to the root and to destroy a data set well it's just the destroy command and you specify the pool name so if I do file um, pool and the data set name so there's no tabbing here I don't know if you can hear the beeping in the background the machines beeping at me um, so you have to know what you want to destroy so if I do ZFS list for example again you can see these stats here how much space has been used and how much is free this is like um, well I won't, I won't explain this for now it will make more sense in a future video when I'll explain some of the um, other features um, but for now because we're you know on a simple data set that's why these two figures are the same at the moment um, but yeah this this is what you have to specify to destroy so I want to destroy the file pool set of S destroy file pool and the data set name is data set and you'll notice with this that there's no warning it's done and there's no way of recovering it either unless you had a backup there's no warning that it's going to um, delete the data set so the only thing you can do here to prevent any mistakes there is a way out of this is to add an option minus n and it's the usual minus n meaning uh, for a lot of other Unix commands in do a dry run you know do everything but don't make any changes it's that sort of meaning so if I do minus n 
Oh, disk pool, not data pool. You'll see it appears to have done it, but if I do ZFS list, it's still there because it's only done it as a dry run. So if, I, if I'm sure that's what I want wanted to happen, I can remove the minus N and you see it takes a little bit longer, a second or so. And now I want to do ZFS list. It has, it has been deleted. Um, now I've never tried this before. Let me try it. I don't know what happens if you try to delete the actual pool data set. It probably won't lay at all. No, it doesn't. So suggesting you could use R to recursively delete that. I still don't think it would work because of the first message. Cannot destroy. It does not apply to pools. I'll try it, but it won't work. I'm sure it won't. No, it's still there. And in fact, it tells you there how to destroy the pool, which we've already seen. So you can't delete the top level data set that the pool um, has created. Um, one other thing you can do with the n command, if I create the data set again, so ZFS list, so I've recreated the data set. If I try and destroy the disk pool data set, another command you can do as well as the n is a v to see, to be more verbose, verbose about what would happen. So it actually says, because I've specified the N with the V, it said this command would destroy this pool data set. So that's an even better way of um, running the destroy command um, with the V, the N and the V together before you actually do the dirty deed, if you like. And if I take the N off, oops, and just put the V, and it says will destroy, well, it obviously does the function after it's printed that message because it will have destroyed it by now. So if we do ZFS list, you can see the data set is gone. So good recommendation before you destroy a data set, do minus VN as an option. So I'll just tidy those up. Disk pull. Oh. Keep forgetting to put the command in. It can't tell what I'm thinking, uh, so I'll destroy. And file pool. 